Welcome to Inside City Hall. I'm your host, Mayor Daryl Seymour, and today on our show we have Chuck Moore, the CEO of Navapache Electric Co-op, and Neil Traver, the Manager of Distribution at APS. Welcome. Chuck. Good morning. Neil. Thank you, Mayor, for Thanks for being with us this morning. I just want to preface here, uh, today we're kind of talking a little bit about Prop 127. We've also asked the representatives who have sponsored this bill, uh, we've extended an invocation for them to show and they chose at this time not to be part. So uh, welcome and we appreciate you being here. You know, it's, it falls in the air. It is. It is. You know, you guys uh, this morning, you know, <coughs> didn't come with coats or muffins or anything, but we've been talking a little bit about the apples and the blossoms that, mm -hmm. you know, last February or April that we thought froze. They didn't yeah. obviously, we'll probably have a bunker year of uh, fruit and everything. So yeah. tell me a little bit about what brings you guys here today and how things are going with APS and NEC. You know, we appreciate what you guys do in our communities. Why don't we start, just share a little bit about what you do that most people maybe not see other than provide electricity. What are some of the other community uh, things that you provide? Oh, for Navapanche, we uh, do a lot of different things. We sponsor a lot of the local events, uh, run to the Pines this weekend. As a matter of fact, we're one of the sponsors. The, Balloon Festival that's coming up in a couple of weeks. We're sponsoring that. Um, we're a sponsor, a sponsor on the uh, uh, recyclable waste that we had a couple of weeks ago. We, you know, so we, we do a lot of things in the community. Try to help out uh, help out the community, help out the members, and and what can, what can we do to give back? Because uh, Navapache is a nonprofit. A lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that, but we're a nonprofit. But so we're trying to do things for our members and also for our communities. That's to, fantastic. To that, so. An APS? No yeah, way. the community is really important to us. We understand that having a community relationship um, is key to our success. We live in these communities. They're important to us. We want these communities to be successful. Some of the things that we've done, similar, um, Chuck mentioned the, the recent environmental dump, so we, could, we, we sponsored that, so people could, could bring in um, electronics. Um, um, household hazardous waste, things like that. Um, the Sholo Youth Foundation, both of both Chuck and I were at that. We sponsored <coughs> that. Um, recently, we've had a big project going to take the the Deuce of Clubs um, electric utilities underground. So that it's a beautification project that we've been working directly with the city on. We've been supporting that and and trying to help support that that project. So there's a lot of different things that we've got going on. Recently, um, the fire the fire department and the police department had a had a baseball game, the Guns and Hoses baseball <laughs> game. APS donated to that so that they could raise funds for for the fire department and the police departments. And it's a lot of fun. We enjoy those types of things. It's it's significantly important to us. Like I said, we live in these communities. They're important to us. And we understand that the community thrives based on our success as well. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, we just want to say thank you for the partnerships we have with you as a city and and also for the benefit that it does give our community. And I know that's what we see right here in Sholo, but you guys are you know, all over your area, you're all over the state and the things that we have. Let's just talk a little bit about your customer base and how many customers each of you kind of have, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this initiative. Okay, at, uh, at NEC, we're, we cover kind of the, um, um, about 10,000 square miles here in eastern Arizona and over into western New Mexico. And, and we serve um, approximately almost 42,000 meters in, in that, that area. You guys are so, so spread out. But you we're know, spread you out. You have a, one of the larger geographical areas that you service too. Just we, we do. We, co we, we have a lot of forest service land in, right. in the area, but we have to cross that land to, you know, to serve folks. But. People don't realize how important that is that when there's a fire, you guys are called out because we've got to shut the power down. We have to make the forest safe to fight the fires. All of that is a big right. part as well. And those distribution lines, you know, 24-7, uh, no matter what the weather is, you guys have to service them. I mean, they're cutting the trees right. down on my road this, uh, this week so that we don't affect your power. You know? Right. And right. so I've got to get a tree removed so, so it doesn't fall and take some lines down. Right. So those are just things that, you know, we as citizens have to be aware of. We take uh, every day. We don't really realize if we flip that switch and there's no power, we're going to be really upset at you. Yeah, Not that's you correct. personally, Chuck, yeah. but we're going to be upset right. that it didn't happen. Right. That's great. Yep. And your base? So we have approximately 1.2 million meters set 
Um, we cover a, a majority of the state. Um, I think we're in 13 of the counties in the state where we have service territory. So the largest provider of the state. And we have a really good working relationship with NEC. Chuck supports us when we need help. We do the same mm -hmm. when, when Chuck needs help. And similar in my, my particular region in northeastern Arizona, um, we cover a lot of the national forest as well. So we have a, a relationship with that group and making sure that we have good, clean power resources and our, and our lines are free of debris and don't have trees falling through them so that the reliability is there. It's really important to us. So we have a good relationship with the uh, Forest Service as well. So we don't really have the side that says if, if Prop 127, there'll be, it's a yes or no <coughs> vote, but it is Prop 127 that we're talking about. Uh, the yes vote would would do some effects possibly, and then a no vote would take the position of keeping things currently how they are. Neil, do you want to just kind of explain that whole proposition a little bit uh, of what it's set up, what they're trying to achieve, and, and, and possibly what are some of the uh, effects of it so that we kind of understand the impact it could have on our communities? Yeah, absolutely. So a yes vote on Prop 127 would make a constitutional mandate. It would amend the Constitution to have a constitutional mandate to get 50% energy from renewable sources by 2030. So we've got about 12 years to comply. And the, the I guess the interesting thing there is how renewables are defined. So in how they define renewables is they exclude certain clean energy produ producing, pro producing generation. For example, Palo Verde, which is a carbon-free pro production. It's the largest energy producer in the, in the United States. It produces 70% of Arizona's clean energy. Um, would be excluded. They specifically wrote out nuclear from that. So it would have those mandates to require those. There's a step of how much would have to be um, distributed energy, what we call distributed energy, or in other words, rooftop solar. So they have specific mandates and what they call RECs, or um, renewable energy credits, that we have to meet. Basically, it all comes down to how much generation we're, we're creating from what they consider to be renewable sources. So they exclude fossil. They exclude um, a couple of interesting ones, uh, trees in excess of 12 inches in diameter, which would not be considered renewable, which is, to me, a strange thing. But there's some, there's some things in there. Nuclear, which is a very clean fuel, is excluded. The, the bill itself is called Clean Energy for a Healthy Arizona. And when you say clean energy for a healthy Arizona, you would think that all clean forms of energy would be allowed to be utilized in this proposition, but that's not the case. I see. Okay. What impact would that possibly have uh, on some of our, our local power plants here that, that we're looking at, our coal-fired and, and some of those? What, what impact, if this were to pass, would, would that have? So right now, you know, a lot of people understand the, that Choya has a finite life, the Choya power plant, which is right here in Navajo County. Mm -hmm. um, the Choya power plant would likely have to shut down earlier than it's anticipated. The Four Corners power plant up in Farmington, New Mexico, um, would have to shut down early 2020s to mid 2020s if this was to pass. And then, then and then um, TEP um, has a power plant over in uh, near Springerville that it would likely cause impacts to the to the future viability of that plant as well. Okay, kind of explain what TEP is. TEP is Tucson Electric Power. Right. They're another regulated utility. Um, that, it, that would be impacted by this bill. And so that's something that, that I didn't mention. The way that this, this proposition has been proposed is it only impacts regulated utilities, or in other words, utilities that have to work with the Arizona Corporation Commission to get its rates approved. So there's utilities in this state um, that would not be impacted by this particular proposition. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're taking the ones that are already regulated and saying, uh, you know, we don't want them uh, or, or impact them the most uh, versus you guys are already working uh, to try to keep rates as, as low as possible for us. That's yeah. correct. Chuck, uh, you want to weigh in on some of these things? Yeah, I would like to just kind of add, add to what, what Neil is saying. It, the, we're regulated, the co-ops in the state, just, just like APS, are regulated by the ACC. Um, so anything that we do to recover those costs, we have to go through the AC to, ACC to recover that. 
This mandate doesn't allow us to do that. It, it, it's a mandate, if this passes, that we have to spend the money. It doesn't matter what the costs are, we still got to spend it to, to meet this, this mandate. Um, the, uh, some of the other concerns with that is, is what we've looked at from, from the co-op standpoint is the, the amount of infrastructure that we would have to put in and the, the stranded assets that we would have to lose, the, the power plants that would have to shut down. It'll impact us. We, we estimate it for our residential consumer about 45 to 65 dollars a month. Um, and, and so we think that's a little ridiculous, <coughs> a little, little, uh, little too, too much for our folks to absorb, especially in the rural communities because in Navajo and Apache counties, we, we have um, the poverty level is, is greater than some of the other areas in the state. And so we think we're gonna be hit a lot harder in, in our areas than we may, may some, some of the other states or some of the areas in the state, such as uh, down at Phoenix, in, you know, inside the city limits. Um, and, and so we, we don't want that to happen because we've worked real hard to try to keep our rates down over the years. And, and since we're a nonprofit, we keep that down and we pass those, those savings on to, to our consumers. This is going to just do the opposite of what we've been trying to do. It's going to increase that. And another thing that maybe a lot of people aren't aware of, the, the Arizona Corporation Commission is working on a, a docket. They have a docket filed and open right now to actually eventually go to 80% clean energy by 2050. And the way that is, it, it's taken into account all clean energy. It's not just looking at renewables. It's looking at clean coal, it's looking at hydro, it's looking at nuclear, it's looking at battery storage, it's looking at all different types of means to have clean energy that a lot of people aren't aware of. And that impacts us as regulated utilities. We're, we're involved in, in that process of reviewing that with the commission to say, okay, what do we need to do for clean energy by 2050 and, and how can we develop those rules within the Arizona Corporation Commission? So ultimately, uh, <clears throat> passing this would ultimately cause a, or potentially, I guess we don't, aren't with certain, but would potentially impact our, our rates that we currently pay. Have you guys done any figures that you have a little bit more understanding of, of what it would take you to get to this mandate and possibly the cost that would be passed on to the consumers? Yeah, like I was just saying a minute ago, we, the study that we've done for the co-ops, uh, um, we haven't been in, involved in any of the studies that, that APS or TEP have, have done, but for, for the co-ops, we, we estimate $45 to $65 a month increase per consumer, for, for our consumers at, at the yeah. co-op level. Yeah, yeah and the studies, the studies that we've done at APS, <clears throat> the analysis that we've done is we estimate the cost of implementation for for our service territory to be approximately $15 billion. And that $15 billion filters down to the individual residential customers at approximately $1,000 a year increase in their bills. And you know that's a significant cost. Um, that w essentially, it's gonna be a doubling of rates for, for the residential customers as well as the commercial and industrial customers that the APS has. This cost, again, I'll go back and and talk to what Chuck said. Interestingly, interestingly enough, on the ballot initiative, when you see it, it'll actually say on the section where you want, where it says a, a yes vote, mm -hmm. it states in there, a yes vote will have the, the mandate to change the constitution, and it literally says, irrespective of cost to customers. So why would they write that in if it was really going to be a cost savings to customers, if this was gonna actually reduce rates? Mm -hmm. It's not going to, um, I think a lot of people know that. So APS has a study that was done by ASU, um, Arizona State University, and this, the Arizona State University kind of basically says the same thing. Economically for the state of Arizona, this is gonna make Arizona non-competitive with our, with local um, states around us, with, the, with our sister states, so to speak. So New Mexico and Colorado and, and Utah, if a, if a big, company wants to come in and move into the state of Arizona, for example, they're going to come in and look at, and if this gets passed, the electric rates are going to be uh, an astronomical number. Let's say they're 
28 cents a kilowatt hour and they come over and they look at Utah or New Mexico and they say, I can go to New Mexico or Utah and get 14 cents a kilowatt hour. It's an, it puts Arizona at an economic disadvantage. So ASU did that study and came out with the data set to say, this is, this is going to be economically devastating to the state of Arizona. And Chuck hit on it really well earlier when he said, in particular, it's gonna impact this region more than normal from the fact of the costs to this region are going to double as well, but our poverty level is already such that we're not on par with some of the rest of the state, which effectively makes us more impacted than other, than other regions. It's interesting how part of the state would be totally unaffected by it, but yet if they you know, voted one way or the other, but yet it would definitely impact another part of the state more difficult. Yeah, absolutely, and I think um, to, to touch on that a little bit, to give some, some background and some detail on that, um, what this will likely do is we'll shut down the Palo Verde Nuclear Gener Generating Station by 2025. Um, and if that shuts down, that is the single largest taxpayer entity in the state of Arizona. Um, it will impact public schools with hundreds of millions of dollars in property tax losses as well as rate increases. So we just went through a pretty significant thing in the state of Arizona with schools and, and education funding. And what this proposition would likely do is raise rates for those schools, which is already obviously having financial difficulties. In addition to it, they're gonna lose hundreds of million dollars in property taxes. I think that's one of the things that we're seeing right now with our county. Uh, we're losing, we, we're looking at projecting what's going to happen when Choi shuts down the mm -hmm. property tax revenues that we're going to lose uh, in the county from that big entity of, of paying in. We've also lost our Abitibi, uh, the, the water you know, c company over here, the paper mill. And so you start losing your biggest producers of property tax and it makes it more difficult to balance budgets. And th that is huge uh, impact on the entire state. I can see how that's a, a very sensitive area that would, would make it very difficult to throw that cost back on the consumers of Arizona, you know, entirely of balancing budgets and going forward. Now let's talk a little bit about this election. We're gonna start seeing uh, early ballots will be coming out so much real time right now. Uh, and probably in the next two weeks or so, people are going to start seeing their ballots, and the final election is going to be November the 6th. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so, you know, I appreciate you sharing uh, the impact of what this can do. A lot of times people, when they say initiative is here, they always talk about jobs, okay? And is this going to, would this create more jobs? Would it take away from jobs? Naturally, if Palo Verde shut down, there's a lot of jobs that would be lost. Has anybody done any studies as to the impact of creating or losing jobs on this proposition? Yeah, so we've done some analysis and some analytics on that one. And, and personally, I, I worked at the Choya Power Plant. I understand the job impact it will have there if it has to shut down sooner rather than later. So there will be lost jobs there. There will be lost jobs um, at the Four Corners Power Plant. There will be lost jobs at the mines associated with those. Um, Palo Verde specifically has over 3,000 employees. Those jobs will be lost. Again, there's an economic impact when you take those jobs out of the state where disposable income now gets pulled away. Um, property taxes get, get affected. So yeah, there will be a significant loss of jobs. Um, again, I think another, another one that I would, would go back to, to to tell the story a little bit of what this is gonna do is RUCO, which is the residential utility um, consumer office, which is the group that comes in when, when we file a rate case or when Navapache files a rate case, RUCO will come in and do analytics and analysis to say whether or not the rates are in fact fair to the residential customers. And RUCO has done their own analysis and, and come out and stated almost what we've, what we've been stating here is that in fact rates will be going up. This isn't something that's going to be reducing rates. And I think all of them the proposition, uh, al although a lot of people think that it, it's admirable, so to speak, saying, hey, we're going to go renewable, renewable itself may not be the right answer if it's going to ec economically be hurtful to the state of Arizona. You know, clean energy 
is a good way to go and, and the right way to go. And, and I think a, a good way to think of it is if the renewable energy portfolio was economically viable, we'd be doing it right now. We'd, right. Be, we'd be pursuing that right now. Um, and I want people to understand, again, this is clean energy for a healthy Arizona. And when you say clean energy, um, then, then why is everything written to renewables? And why does it exclude Palo Verde when Palo Verde is already clean? Why would, why would they want to shut that plant down? So something very similar, I shouldn't say very similar, this exact proposition or law is on the books in California. And California's rates are three times the national average. And just recently, Canyon Diablo, which is their last nuclear generating station, just announced as a result of these, these types of mandates that it's going to be shutting down in 2025. So, you know, you, I'll talk to people about this and they'll say, well, we, we really don't want to shut nuclear down. It's not really gonna shut nuclear down. Well, it really is because California no longer has nuclear and their last, their last nuclear plant just recently announced that it's going to have to shut down because of what these renewable mandates are doing. And, Cal and the reality of it is nuclear is a very cost-effective way to create energy and a very clean way to create energy. That's great. Chuck? Yeah, just to kind of add on to what Neil is saying, this, this is similar to, to what California has. And I think if you look at California's rates, I think they're like 47% above what Arizona's rates are. So this would have the same impact that, that California's having. It's going to raise the rates. Um, the, the other issue is that people don't understand this model that's in California, which they're trying to, to bring it into Arizona, the reliability of the system, the electrical system, uh, has went down. And uh, the utilities over there have to do rolling brownouts. So in other words, they have to take outages during parts of the day on their system because they don't have the generation uh, to be able to support the load uh, that, that people are consuming. And so they're having to do uh, uh, brownouts or roll, rolling brownouts. And trying to get the system back up during outages is, is more difficult. And a lot of people don't realize that. But that, that's what's how that, that is working over there. And California just recently increased theirs to, to go to 100% renewables um, by 2050 or 2045, I believe. That's correct. Um, that, they're, that they want to go to 100%. And they already have problems with, with where they're at today. And they only have 17% renewables. Yeah. And they're already having uh, reliability issues. And they have to export some of that energy during the day when the, the sun is shining because no one's consuming it during those hours. So they have to export it and pay other places to take it. So it doesn't make a whole lot of good business sense to me to be able to do that. Um, so why take the folks from California who are pushing this because this is being funded by, by a California uh, hedge fund uh, that is actually uh, funding this into California and, and have the same kind of policies. Policies so, yeah. make sense. Yeah. Anything else you guys want to want to share? Uh, we're just going to you know give you kind of a last minute here. Yeah, I would I would go back to just real quick reiterating the fact of the the propositions called clean energy for a healthy Arizona, and they're purporting <coughs> that passing this will clean up the air. In reality number one, that probably won't happen and likely it'll be just the opposite. And when I say that is because if it's clean energy for a healthy Arizona, when they're trying to make it clean, they're excluding nuclear from the mix. And so what that means is if nuclear has to go away or gets shut down, the baseload generation or generation when solar's not there still has to be picked up from somewhere. There has to be a load there available. And what will likely happen is that we'll be there will be a creation or generation of gas and oil fleet will have to be increased. So we'll have to create a whole, whole lot of new generation, what we call peaking load, um, our combustion turbines that can come online rapidly when solar goes away or when a cloud comes by or when a storm blows in or the dust comes and covers up the solar. So you have to have some form of generation that can pick up that load when the solar's not available or at night. And that load will likely be 
fossil fuels of some form. Um, and so what's likely to happen is you get, a, get rid of nuclear, which is clean, not any carbon footprint at all, and you come back with fossil fuel that's going to produce carbon. Mm -hmm. So that's really not going to be clean at all. The second side of that is if it was really intended to be clean, then why did they intentionally ride out the non-regulated utility in the state, which is a massive carbon producer? And they didn't, there, were, there was no intention to clean that up or pick them up. So it's really misleading, that title. It's not clean and it's not going to improve the health of Arizona at all. And it's going to be economically devastating to the state. Okay, appreciate that. Chuck, any final comments? Um, kind of final comments, is, it kind of got to uh, agree with Neil. It, it's, um, um, it's going to have an impact to all the consumers, and, and it's really not a clean initiative or a clean amendment. And my, my one concern, too, is if, you, if the way it's written and, it, and if it becomes a constitutional amendment, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of it. Um, what happens if technology changes? What happens if wind and solar isn't really the best renewable technology out there? What if something else comes along? Well, you're still mandated. Now you've got this in the Constitution that you can't change it. You can't go to the Arizona Corporation Commission and go, hey, we've got some new, new things, new technology. We want to bring that and use that instead of wind or solar. And another th point that people need to understand is for the state of Arizona, when you look at a lot of the wind studies in Arizona, Arizona is not a state that can, can support a lot of wind generation. We just don't have the wind here. Uh, I think there's only, only in one. Only North America. Oh, uh, I mean, North Arizona, sorry. <laughs> yeah, there's actually only one, there's actually one area, there's only one area that uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, has classified as a good wind source, and it's actually close to Bullhead City mm, and within the state, because you have to have a certain amount of wind, mm that's got to flow a certain speed for a certain period of time. Yeah. And we don't have that across the state. Uh, we have a lot of sun, so you can right. put solar panels in. So there's a little bit of misunderstanding of how this is going to impact everybody. It's like you're just not going to put wind turbines everywhere. Right. So, well, Guys, I appreciate you being here today. Appreciate okay. your input on this. We started with fall is in the air. So yeah. I want your prediction of the first day that it's going to freeze so that we kick on our <laughs> furnaces and start burning more electricity for both of you. So, so Neil, what day is we going to have our first uh, 31 degree temperature or 32 freezing? I'm going to say October 15th. October 15th. Chuck? November 10th. November 10th, okay. I'm, yep. a, I'm a Halloween guy, yeah. okay, October 31st. So, <laughs> oh, okay. Know, have a good time. Well, thanks for being here today, yeah. Neil. Thank you Appreciate very much, it. Mayor. Chuck. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you for joining us on Inside City Hall today, and we hope you have a great day.